today on Main Street Living. Two questions this morning. First, what is your obsession? What is the most important thing in your life that you may even be thinking about right now as you listen to my voice? And second, is it strong enough or worthy enough to be the focus of your life for the years that you have ahead of you? And will it carry you all the way through to the end? The worship service will begin after our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The epistle reading is written in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14, where St. Paul says, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 20th chapter. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. 
When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, When this, what, what then is this that is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. But they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies to pretend to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for my message today is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. Two questions this morning. First, what is your obsession? What is the most important thing in your life that you may even be thinking about right now as you listen to my voice? And second... Is it strong enough or worthy enough to be the focus of your life for the years that you have ahead of you? And will it carry you all the way through to the end? Whether you're 15 years old, 30 years old, or older, is your obsession something that will still be energizing you 10 or 20 years from now, filling your imagination, making life worth living, and pulling you forward into each new day? Our epistle reading for today was written in Paul's letter to the Philippian Christians, a group of Christians in what is now modern-day northeastern Greece. And what Paul writes to them gives us a rare glimpse into the fire burning within his heart and what it was that pulled him forward each day. So we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3, and I encourage you, if you're able, to read your Bible along with me if you can. St. Paul is still, to this day, known as one of the greatest theologians of Scripture. His letters are filled to the brim with a heaviness that can sometimes lead us to miss a real sense of Paul as a person. 
But this is not the case today. Let me tell you a little bit about Paul. Paul is fascinating because of where he came from. He was a Hebrew, a Jew, and yet also a Roman citizen. He was very well educated, and he knew his culture through and through. He was a young and rising star, but powerful Pharisee. He was also absolutely convinced that followers of Jesus were heretics. And he was making a successful career out of rounding them up, persecuting them, and doing his best to make sure that others hated them as well. Paul was there and may have even taken part in the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Paul had the world by the tail. And there was no reason for him to throw all of that away to instead go around from town to town getting beat up for preaching Jesus to people, getting thrown in jail for being a heretic in the eyes of his former friends. That is, until that one day when he was on the Damascus Road where he was confronted face to face with the risen Jesus and had his whole life turned around. Some use that event as the starting point of an argument for the Christian faith. Because when you look at Paul, there was just no rational explanation for what he did. That is, unless it was God who gripped him and turned him around. It certainly wasn't a case of Paul being racked with guilt or angst regarding the Jewish law, as some people have suggested. As far as Paul was concerned, he had kept the law flawlessly. He had it all nice and neat, wrapped up, tied up, ready for delivery back to God, saying, here it is, mission accomplished. But then one day, on the road to Damascus, while seeking to arrest followers of Jesus, that thin veneer of faith fell apart when Paul met the risen Christ. Now I want you to hear Paul tell it firsthand. You heard what Paul said in our second lesson just a little bit ago, but without a little bit of context, it may sound like Paul was boasting. Far from it, in fact. Now we started reading at Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, but we need to start a few verses before that. And as we do, I suggest that you hold on to your seats. Starting in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, St. Paul writes, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. There are some heat in those words. And this is because there was a group that was going around saying, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, first you have to be a follower of Abraham and be circumcised. And in general, then, you have to follow perfectly the law of Moses and all these extra rules. Paul saw the treachery in all of that, though, and he was immediately all over it. He knew very well that if you start saying that, you end up putting your confidence in the things that you do, in the flesh, as Paul calls it, rather than in the one and only thing that makes a difference. That is what Christ has already done for you on the cross, forgiving you all of your sins. All that circumcision and genealogy stuff is history, Paul says. But... If you want to start strutting your stuff on that level, he says, I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. It's meaningless. It's pointless. I no longer put my trust in it, he says. But I've been there. And if you want to play that game, I will match you point for point. And that's where he then continues with what we heard in our second reading, saying, if anyone else thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Blameless. Like I said, Paul felt that he had previously had everything wrapped up in a box, tied neatly ready for delivery back to God. Paul had once believed that he had the law of Moses licked as a Pharisee. And now he was going out to beat the church, which he saw as a heretic group. Until he met Jesus, was stopped in his tracks, and was turned around. 
And thus he goes on, although in a very different tone. He says, but whatever gain I had, I now count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Rubbish. Now other translations often say here refuse or filth, but the Greek literally means dung. The word scubalone from Koine Greek is used frequently in literature. It's used theatrically in emotionally charged contexts where the author seeks to invoke a sense of revulsion and disgust in his audience. Now, there were worse terms than dung that could be utilized, but the basic idea is still there. Paul wants his listeners and his readers to know with how much contempt he views his former life and ways. And St. Paul continues, But whatever gain I had, I now count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that that depends on faith. St. Paul was a changed man. He was a man who had a new obsession. He had previously been, been obsessed and gripped by the law of Moses and by his own grasp and understanding of the law. It had been his life. It was his master. But now in Christ, Paul had a new obsession, a new life, a new master. How do you hear those words? How do you hear Paul? The fact that you're listening to my words implies that something is happening in your life. You've brought yourself to this place, to this moment, or maybe you've been brought by someone else. Either way, God is seeking to work in and with you through his word. What does believing in Jesus mean to you? Is it just a laundry list of things that you have to acknowledge, which, if you give assent... You're in? You know, it's even possible for us to turn faith in Jesus into a sort of checklist religion like Paul had done as a Pharisee. I go to church. I can give intellectual thought to the things that are said. The Bible says if you believe, you're in. So I guess that makes me in. And that all sounds nice. But there is so much more. Real faith is what happens when knowing the facts moves on to living the relationship. Let me say that once again. Faith is what happens when knowing the facts moves on to living the relationship. It's a moment-by-moment relationship with Jesus Christ. A real relationship with a real God. Baptized into his death, we are reborn in him. We are forgiven and made children of God. And at that point, with that relationship, life changes. It has to. Life's priorities change. We get gripped by a different obsession, as it were. And Paul goes on from where I left off in Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to listen with eager urgency with which he writes. He has just described himself as not having a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but that which is, in, which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. That's the theological Paul. That's the, the Paul that we thank God for because he spelled it out so clearly for us. But then Paul goes on to share the fire that he has within. The obsession that propelled him forward every day. Not merely the facts, but the relationship. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible 
I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I know Christ, Paul says. I want to know him better. Like others in the early church, Paul so identified with Jesus that he also fully expected to share in his sufferings. The basis for his hope, the basis for his trust in the promised resurrection from the dead did not rely on his own suffering. It relied on his relationship with his Lord and Savior. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul was so changed, so transformed and gripped, and yes, we can even say obsessed with that life-reorienting relationship that he wanted others, people around the world, people like you and I, to know it as well. Paul was at what he considered the top of his game when Jesus got a hold of him and turned him around. So what is your obsession? What thing or experience are you saving money for? What stores and websites do you visit most often? Will whatever it is carry you through what's coming at you in life? Paul discovered Not only that which was true, but that which would carry him through to the very end and even into eternity. We've heard what he wrote to the Philippians, which he wrote from prison. Paul spent a fair amount of time in prison for his faith. The book of Acts describes Paul's travels, how at the end he was brought in chains before Roman governors and magistrates. Even there, nearing the time when he would be put to death, He earnestly confronted his challengers with the gospel, which had gripped him and changed his life. I want you to listen to Paul before a governor named Festus and a king named Agrippa. In Acts chapter 26, Paul has just spoken of Jesus' resurrection. And it says, at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it wasn't done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long. I pray, God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. That all might become what I am except for these chains. Some folks start off as rising stars like Paul. Others have first had to crash and burn. But what they share in common is a life formerly obsessed with things that led only to death, but now in the grip of Christ, leading to an open door to new life. It's only in knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection, only in walking in the grip of that relationship that our lives will flourish as God intends them to. And every single time we rightly partake of our Lord's Holy Supper, we do so with all the saints around the world, both asleep and in heaven, with each of us walking hand in hand with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me leave you with some of St. Paul's words in closing. St. Paul said, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal in Christ Jesus. God has given us the reason and the ability to press on, ever running toward our eternal goal as he runs in us and through us and alongside us every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of our God, which surpasses all understanding, 
Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for viewing Main Street Living this morning. I'm Reverend Scott Seiler, the president of the South Dakota District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and one of the preachers on this program. Main Street Living has been on the air since January 6, 2002, thanks to God directing and blessing this program. For these many years, it has been our mission to help you to know and trust the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is free to us, but it costs Jesus his very life. Sometimes we use the word grace as an acronym to express this good news. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, willingly given by our triune God because He loves you so much. Today you have heard good news like this on our program. Thank you for tuning in today to Main Street Living. We ask that you pray for God's continued blessing upon this program and please consider giving a gift to support this ministry and keep it on the air so that many others may know God's saving grace for them. You may send your gift to this address, Main Street Living, 1400 South Duluth Avenue, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57105. Tune in again next week to Main Street Living. And until then, remember that God loves you so very much and that His grace God's riches at Christ's expense is something you can count on every day of your life.